This episode of Two Guys Who Dive, recorded live, 31 August 2013, episode 76, Unique Encounters. Well, welcome once again to another episode of Two Guys Who Dive, and I am your host, Rob Wade, and you'll notice that my cohort is not here again this week. Uh, he got called out to work uh, a little bit by surprise, even though he said, and we have it on, on video, we, he said last week that uh, he was not going to have a conflict, so I think he could have pulled a longer straw rather than the short one this time. However, that's okay. We still have a lot of stuff that we weren't able to get to last week, Oh, and we have our guest appearance from Ronan here. Let me pick him up. There he is. All right. Say hi to everybody. Really? Not going to? Okay. All right. So anyway, uh, yeah, we had a lot that we didn't get to last week, so we're going to try to roll a lot of that in uh, for this week. And uh, starting off, uh, we had last night, we got to celebrate uh, the 25th wedding anniversary of some friends of ours, Hugo and Susie Bontel Bontello. Uh, it was an awesome uh, ceremony. It was really nice to see uh, Susie all decked out. You'll get to see actually a, a picture or two from that a little bit later as I show off some of the, uh, some of the awesome pics that the Lumia... 1020 can take um, but it was a really great ceremony 25 years uh, Tara and I just finished celebrating our 24th anniversary so next year it's awesome we're going to be celebrating our 25th the good old silver anniversary and uh, it's, it's really nice to see uh, couples lasting this long because it's happening less and less in fact you know, marriage just seems to be taking a back seat to all sorts of things uh, I, I, I get kind of angry when I read on the internet how this couple is expecting their first child and it's this celebrity and her fiance. I'm like, hello, you got the cart before the horse. You need to get it straight. Build the nest first. Build the relationship, get married, build the nest, and then have kids. That's the proper way to do it. <clears throat> there is no universe where it makes sense to do it any other way. And yet we as human beings seem to have concocted this uh, strange idea that it's okay to do something else. So uh, shame on you people for making society uh, not really care about family by building this kind of situation where we celebrate, celebrate uh, getting this all backwards. So congratulations to Hugo and Susie and their whole family. That is an awesome accomplishment this day and age. And it was great to be, um, be part of that ceremony. So the title of the episode this week is Unique Encounters, and this is kind of, some of it's going to be loosely tied to that, some of it's going to be obviously tied to that, and there's a number of interesting things going on. Uh, of course, we find ourselves uh, potentially on the brink of yet another war as our president decides whether or not he wants to... Uh, get us involved in the mess over in Syria. I look at it this way. Uh, you've got a bad regime that gasses his people. You've got uh, a bad resistance that in the Muslim Brotherhood, who they're known terrorists, they're beating each other up and killing each other. Let them at it. We'll clean up after the mess is all over with. It's tragic that there are innocent people caught in the middle of it, but there are tragic. it's tragic because there are middle there are innocent people caught in the middle of this stuff everywhere all over the world throughout history we simply cannot be all things to all people and be everywhere we can't we can't afford it it's obvious that, that our government is way overspent and uh, we already are a bit war weary from being involved in a number of, of conflicts uh, some justified, some not, in many people's opinions. And as much as hawkish as I am, uh, I'm, I'm saying, I, I, I hashtag a lot, stay out of Syria. We just don't need to go in there. We can't afford to, and there's just no real clear-cut sides. 
uh, we're just opening ourselves up for an even more dangerous version of Vietnam, in my opinion. So, uh, but <clears throat> interestingly, a uh, uh, an actor, comedic actor that I'm a big, uh, big fan of, uh, John Cleese has made the rounds with a. Uh, uh, a writing, if you will, a posting about alerts to threats. And basically it's his take on how, th how the th threat levels are increasing uh, around Europe. Uh, I think it's hilarious. I'm a big po uh, Monty Python fan. And a friend of mine on Facebook uh, posted uh, this, uh, this thing that he wrote. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to execute um, my version of John Cleese. Uh, in reading this uh, alert to threats. Uh, alerts to threats in 2013 Europe from John Cleese. The English are feeling the pinch in relation to recent events in Syria and have therefore raised the security level from miffed to peeved. Soon though security levels may be raised yet again to irritated or even a bit cross. The English have not been a bit cross since the Blitz in 1940 when the tea supplies ran out. Terrorists have been recategorized from tiresome to a bloody nuisance. The last time the British issued a bloody nuisance warning level was in 1588 when threatened by the Spanish Armada. The Scots have raised their threat level from pissed off to let's get the bastards and they don't have any other levels. This is the reason they have been used out on the front line of the British Army for the last 300 years. The French government announced yesterday that it has raised its terror level uh, from run to hide. The only two higher levels in France are collaborate and surrender. The rise was precipitated by a recent fire that destroyed France's white flag factory, effectively paralyzing the country's military capability. Italy has increased the alert level from shout loudly and excitedly to elaborate military posturing. Two more re levels remain, ineffective combat operations and change sides. The Germans have increased their alert state from disdainful arrogance to dress in uniform and sing marching songs. They also have two higher levels, invade a neighbor and lose. Belgians, on the other hand, are all on holiday as usual, and the only threat they th they're worried about is NATO pulling out of Brussels. The Spanish are all excited to see their new submarines ready to deploy. These beautifully designed subs have glass bottoms so the, Spanish, the new Spanish Navy can get a really good look at the old Spanish Navy. Australia, meanwhile, has raised its security level from no worries to she'll be right, mate. Two more escalation levels remain. Crikey, I think we'll need to cancel the Barbie this weekend. And the Barbie is cancelled. So far, no situation has ever warranted use the use of the last final escalation level. Regards, John Cleese, British writer, actor, and tall person. And as a final thought, Greece is collapsing, the Iranians are getting aggressive, and Rome is in disarray. Welcome back to 430 BC. Life is too short. <laughs> I think that man is hilarious. He's... He, <laughs> he uses comedy to make some obvious uh, uh, statements about the world that we live in. And interestingly, Monty Python as a group throughout history has actually made interesting commentaries on, uh, on social life, uh, kind of illustrating, uh, being silly to illustrate the absurdity that we often get to in society. <laughs> I can't say that I necessarily agree with all the kind of statements and points that they, they try to make, but for the most part, they're pretty much spot on, as they say. So, uh, John Cleese, well done. Uh, you never cease to amaze me and make me laugh. So, uh, again, keeping with the theme of unique encounters, uh, maybe you got to see this on the news. I thought this was pretty amazing. Uh, from our from the DiverWire.com, they they posted on this, and this was pretty interesting. Uh, some divers out in does it say where? 
California Central Coast. And of course, those who are familiar with uh, diving in California, that's all that's colder water because of the way the circulation of the the uh, the the water temperatures are. All of the water circulates from. Uh, the Arctic Circle down along the the western coast. It all goes clockwise in the northern hemisphere. So, uh, as the water sweeps down along the the western coast, there, that water that's brought down is cooler, which is why you often see a lot of the whales there, uh, especially for the migration. And so, this this organization uh, takes people out diving and spearfishing, etc., in that area. And so, you'll see that they're they're seriously wrapped up in. Uh, I think they're in dry suits or at least really thick wetsuits. But this video is pretty wild. So th they're out there diving. Uh, get rid of the advertisements. Oops. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. Let's try this. Go back here. All right, let's skip ahead. So all of a sudden you hear and see all these sardines. And like, what? And then here's why. They're all running from these humpback whales who breached scooping up <laughs> I think this is a trip that is pretty amazing that is pretty amazing talk about a close encounter <clears throat> you know the first hint if you see if you see a bunch of sardines coming up I'd be thinking what are they being chased by and that's slow motion of the uh, I think that is absolutely uh, amazing to get to see something like that now obviously that could have been uh, that could have been really dangerous uh, because you know, those things are massive, and they literally could scoop you up. If you, I mean, you see how big they were compared to the human beings who were diving. Uh, just absolutely amazing. But, you know, we, uh, when we talk about diving, we've, we've shared this more recently on, on, on recent episodes, talking about how you, you do have to be careful when you're around underwater life because you never know... Uh, what kind of reaction you're going to get. And some things happen totally by accident because that sea life may or may not be aware of your presence, which is why you don't want to necessarily get too close or force an interaction. In this case, uh, we're not seeing a lot of the history, what was going on up to this point, but uh, I did hear one of the comments of the diver saying, I knew that was going to happen. Well, okay, so that tells me that they were doing something that gave them an idea that some sort of encounter was going to happen. And you, you, you just never can be too sure. Uh, no matter how good your skills are, now how much experience that you have, uh, the equipment that you're carrying, it may not be enough to prepare you for uh, a potentially dangerous encounter. You know, with, with, if that had been, if those had been... Um, uh, whale sharks, orcas, I mean, uh, not whale shark, sharks, orcas or killer whales. If that had been uh, an encounter with a couple of those, it could have been a lot more tragic because uh, the way they were dressed, they could have been mistaken for seals or sea lions, which of course is a staple for, uh, that's, that's one of the main diets for, for orcas. So that could have been pretty tragic. But still, that was an amazing encounter, and just to have to have that on video, that's just one of those things that you you take with you forever, kind of thing. It was pretty impressive. So uh, that's just an example of one of those interesting encounters. So um, speaking of unique encounters, <laughs> uh, earlier this week, uh, the internet has been all abuzz with. Uh, 
some rather shocked comment or shocked reactions to a certain singer slash actress Miley Cyrus. Uh, I shouldn't be surprised these days by anything that comes out of pop culture that comes out of um, the entertainment industry because it seems like just as soon as you get a performer who um, has a good reputation, seems to have their head on their shoulders, has not allowed themselves to get eaten up with the stardom and the money and the power that they suddenly do everything they can to just trash all that as if what they're going for, the trashiness, the, the, the lowest common denominator is something to be celebrated. And unfortunately, there are people that celebrate it. I was watching clips of the, the, her, Miley Cyrus's sorry excuse for her performance uh, at the, uh, the VMAs. And there were people right up there on the, uh, at the edge of the stage just absolutely screaming, just hollering, and, and just really enjoying it. I, I, I felt like, where are your parents? Why isn't there somebody just coming around, just slapping the snot right out of each one of you? That that that, that kind of behavior is celebrated. So, uh, it just unfortunately, it appears now that we have in the long line of child actors, performers going down the old tubes. We have now got. Lindsay Lohan, followed by Amanda Bynes, and now the latest addition to this, Miley Cyrus, who appears to have some sort of tongue malfunction, because the girl came out sticking her tongue out to the side, and then she pulled it back in, I guess because the drool was getting too much, and then... She was like, oh, I got to stick my tongue out again. And so she kept sticking it out and pulling back in. It's like, what is wrong with your tongue? Do you not have control of your, your body parts or something? Clearly she didn't because then she got, did the, this, uh, sorry, excuse for twerking, which is what really shocked most people. Well, the girl's just completely gone. I expect to see her arrested at some point for doing something stupid. It's probably not going to be too much longer before we see her, uh, her uh, mug shot from being arrested posted on the internet. It's sad. Just hope that she gets her act together, uh, and I hope more girls don't take uh, take that lead and follow in her footsteps. That's just uh, talk about a unique encounter. That's just horrifying, horrifying. <clears throat> so. Uh, along the lines of unique encounters, you get to, uh, uh, speaking of actors and performers, we uh, mentioned last week that Tara and I had just, uh, part of our summer hiatus, why the, sh why the show hasn't been on for a while is because we were involved in the uh, upstage production of Curtains. And so um, we had a great time with that. It's always a lot of work and you build friendships and relationships with with some really good people, some good performers, and you just have a great time, even as you're getting exhausted uh, working on these shows. But it's well worth it. Uh, audiences entertain, which they clearly were with this show, and then everybody bolted off to Parts Unknown. Most of them were going off to college. And then some of us back to work, back to the real world. But I just want to share a... Uh, just some of the some pictures, uh, courtesy of uh, of David Loftus, the father of uh, one of the main actors in the show, Daniel Loftus. Uh, he's got a great photography uh, side business going, and you'll see just get an idea from some of the shots here. So here's the front of the Paul Pogue Theater there on Main Street, the old part of town, uh, uh, with the of course our uh, announcing our show. And our director, Fred Brockwell, he is the founder of the Upstagers, and he's kind of starting to wind down. I mean, he's, he's been at it for, for, you know, since the 70s, <laughs> excuse me, and uh, he's kind of earned a break. You know, we, we, we uh, split up the directing responsibilities amongst uh, a number of, of, of folks who've, who've been directing shows. Uh, all of which have been actors before, so it's you kind of it's as you typically see in Hollywood to people stepping from in front of the camera to behind the camera or in front of you know you see 
you see that situation. That's a uh, number of us have, have been in the director's seat before. But Fred's got a, a you know, he's got a wonderful style, a tried and true style. And uh, as he moves on to uh, greener pastures, uh, at some point, he's, he's going to finally hang up his director's clapboard and uh and move on but uh, it was great having him direct this show and he got to actually the sing in this show which was interesting and uh i think he was probably about as nervous about that as anybody else was about any other performing uh, it was interesting even though it was a small singing part it was a solo and it opened act two so no pressure there but fred did a, a great job with that and uh, here's uh, we had great we had great sets, great costumes, uh, great uh, backdrops that we ordered for the show. Just a fantastic job. Wonderful costumes. And David did a great job taking pictures. And you may recognize my wife Tara on the left there. <clears throat> there's the group of us there this was a fun number to do and it was probably one of the first ones that actually came fully together uh, as a particular number in the show I'm being handed a note And there's Tara again. There's a shot of Scott Van Landingham is one of those unique actors who uh, he's very quiet till you get him on the stage and he gets his parts down. And then he just comes alive. He just explodes into character. It's, it's always a joy working aside him. <coughs> and Lulu, who's standing next to him, she uh, uh, wonderful dancer. And she really, she really came into her own in, uh, in this show. It was a great, great part for her. She worked hard for that. One of the group numbers, again, just fun with the costumes in a show like this. Quite a variety. Ben Graff, uh, I've, I've been acting with him on stage since he was really just a little kid. <laughs> He's literally grown up on stage and, and uh, turned into a wonderful actor. Another one of the big ensemble numbers. Great expressions on people's faces. I, I love that David caught a number of these, uh, a number of these shots where you get great reactions from the cast. You know, it's it's often challenging when you're when you're not in a main speaking part. Um, you're considered part of the what that we call the company, and it's 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 often challenging for actors to step up to the plate and actually be in the moment to react to what's happening and look like you're reacting with other people, as you would in reality if you were in a situation like this where everybody's gathered around to see something. There would be honest reactions, and you have to think about not acting, but but acting yourself in that situation and then just stepping up that display a little bit so that the audience it reads to the audience you know the the challenge with and uh david reinsmith here is a <laughs> he's got great expressions and the, he he really puts himself into every character uh this is a this character was definitely made for him um the the challenge with um the challenge with stage acting compared to acting on film is that you have multiple camera angles that will pick something up and you can get close-ups and so it's like you're the third person standing right there where the action's going on 
Whereas in stage acting, the audience is very typically very far removed, even as a front row seat, is very far removed from the actors. And so as an actor, you have to learn where that line is between exaggeration, uh, car uh, caricature of your your expressions to uh, not crossing that line and keeping it to the point where you've exaggerated your expressions enough to where it reads well to the audience without looking overdone. A great musical moment in the show with Sierra and Ben. Another challenge in... Uh, acting, stage and film as well, is the blocking. And you want to have stage pictures. Uh, we often guard against uh, straight lines or always making things too symmetrical. You want to throw some unusual breaks in a line in, the, in where people are standing and, it, and not have, her, but have everyone staying in the same pose. And so as an actor, you're not just thinking about uh, you're not just thinking about the uh, what your next line is or uh, what your uh, your cues are or where you're supposed to be standing, but how you're standing there. How are you reacting to what's going on on stage? So you have the four of us here that are in different stances uh, as the action's moving on, and it, and it doesn't look uncomfortable and it doesn't look like a straight line. But it wouldn't necessarily be a natural grouping of people if you were in uh, a, a real situation. Probably everyone would be much closer together. But this creates a better stage picture. Utilization of the stage, as they say. <clears throat> and no, I'm not scolding Ben. I was singing a number. And then one of the few times I've gotten to actually act opposite my, my own wife in a show. <laughs> so uh, this was a, a good role for us, playing uh, estranged husband and wife, separated. And again, love the costumes. They're wonderful. Great dancers, great performers. Lots of red in this show. Lots of red. And there's Tara showing her stuff. She is such a wonderful performer. She knows how to work the stage, as you can see here. And Daniel, of course, is just he just lights up on the stage. Great job. This was a fantastic number in the show. Again, with the group, I love these. And this was not, this wasn't, Posed. I mean, we all this this all happens kind of uh, on the fly. It was never exactly the same uh, grouping every night. Uh, so, it was, and it was a great shot taken by uh, by David. Again, great stage looks, great expressions. Literally hands in the cookie jar kind of situation. That's what this was. This was uh, pretty much the opening of Act 2. There's Daniel and Tara. Everybody sneaking around looking for a killer. And then Sierra and myself. And then David Graff and Scott Van Landingham. Again, <laughs> expressions are great. Oh yes, the totem pole. This uh, number was challenging because all the uh, the actors had to time their popping in and out through the curtains or above the curtains or below the curtains to sing along with what was going on. It was awesome. And took a lot of work. Yes, we like to spend a lot of time in the jammies. <laughs> Great number. It's a business. Cindy Rhinesmith. 
There's Lulu and Daniel. That was a great dance number. Lots of hard work. Lots of hard work went into that. And again, the sets and costumes just really showed off uh, what the upstagers, a little community theater, can do. Oh, and then one of my favorite pictures of Tara and I. As we finally come back together and sing a duet. I love singing duets with Tara. One of the big dance numbers. This was pretty cool. This was a lot of fun. Uh, and for guys there who are not typically used to dancing, uh, they put a lot of hard work into getting this to look good. Of course, you know, if you can, if you can get the form right and just show off the girls, that's really the, the, the hardest part right there. But they couldn't just stand there, so they worked hard to get the steps that they got. <laughs> And one of the big numbers, uh, this is pretty cool, a lot of work in um, layers of, of different, three different songs basically working together at the same time, and it was really good. And the killer is revealed. And then as everybody moves towards the end of the show, Tara and I got to kiss one more time. <laughs> and there she is. The star of the show. <laughs> and looking great in that white dress, too. And our cast and crew, lots of work. L tons of lighting cues, tons of sound cues. It was, uh, and then so many scene changes. It was just amazing. Lots of great work by lots of great people. And so that was the, uh, that was our show, Curtains. Great show, great show. And thanks, David, for doing a good job with the pictures. Uh, so, uh, last week, what we wanted to do was to share with you uh, we shared a lot of the video from the Grand Cayman trip, but what we ran out of time was, even after a two-hour show, we ran out of time to show you the um, the video from our Balmeray trip, uh, where it, it turned out to be just Tara and myself going up to Balmeray for our anniversary weekend, 24th anniversary. We had a great time anyway. I just, uh, It's really fun to drive up there. It's beautiful scenery. Uh, beautiful area and just fun, relaxing diving. And it wasn't as crowded as, uh, crowded as we expected it to be. Uh, it's been much more crowded before, which is okay. And, you know, there were still uh, dive teams there going through kids, going through training and everything. So visibility got challenged at different points, but it wasn't as bad as it normally is. So uh, let me uh, bring up the video. I think you'll enjoy this uh, video. I put a little bit more effort into it this time. Kind of merge some things together. So let's get it going here.
It is just so incredibly easy to dive there. Especially when you when you when you when you're diving earlier in the morning and later in the afternoon where the sunlight is not as direct you really get some nice uh, light effects in the water and there's Tara doing her little trick where she calls the fish the fish whisperer and they are so used to people <laughs> And so since I typically am doing all of the picture taking and video taking, rarely do I get shots of me actually diving. So I gave Tara, Tara the camera and just let her work it for a while so I could kind of have some, some fun. There I am going inverted. <clears throat> I love diving that way. See, this is, this is what you want to work toward is a comfort level in the water where you're operating in three dimensions and it's it's easy you notice I can cruise pretty close to the bottom without actually bouncing and very little effort and it's all just getting the more you dive the easier this gets and here are all the fish gathering around <clears throat> but the longer you dive the easier it gets if you concentrate on these things and eventually it becomes second nature to you and you you know your equipment which is and and you get comfortable with it and so your movements are not they're effortless which is another reason why we say uh, you should really go out and get your own gear as soon as possible even if you do it a piece at a time get your gear as soon as you can so that uh, you can dive with it exclusively as much as possible so that this kind of diving is second nature to you. You see, Tara, Tara doesn't dive as much as I do because A, I'm an instructor so I'm diving all the time with students but she's also not a fan of diving in, in the freshwater. But she'll do it. But she dives every opportunity that is reasonable for her, you know, for her to do, given, given the level of enjoyment she wants to get out of it. And so we make these trips to Balmeray quite frequently because she just, she'll spend a lot of time in the water. And you see how, uh, how comfortable she is in the water. I mean, again... She just makes it look very effortless. And it's funny because I, I can remember, and she'll tell you, uh, when she first started diving, that even the first several dives that she went, in, she went on after being certified, there was a little bit of apprehension. You know, just, I want to get moving, I want to get moving. She just, staying still underwater was not comfortable for her. But now, she doesn't have to be moving at all. I mean, she just hangs there in three dimensions. And it's just comfortable. It looks comfortable. <clears throat> I love this camera, and I'm, I'm. The more I use it, the more, uh, the more comfortable I get with the settings. I, I was playing with some more settings on, uh, uh, on this trip, that I wished I'd had. I had. Um, played with on our Grand Cayman trip, I would have gotten even better pictures and video out of that. <clears throat> but I'm learning. And there's the pervy turtle. Those who saw the episode, the pervy turtle, uh, got to see the, again, the unique encounter that we had, especially Tara, with this turtle where it came down and uh, played with us, literally played with us, and uh, decided to take a little nibble on her ear well, I came around and I just happened to turn the camera around and there he, she, whatever, was right there sitting on top of the, the foliage. And so I was like, okay, let's see if I can get some video. So I got, I, I kind of moved back and forth between video and pictures. And I got some great close-up video of the turtle. Yeah. <sighs> 
So he said, okay, I've had enough. I need, I need some air. <clears throat> so there he goes, cruising up to the surface, grabs a gulp of air. And then screams to the bottom to disappear in the foliage. It's amazing. I mean, you just watch. He'll get to the, to the grassy area and then just bury himself into it. Going, going, gone. And then the next day, he was out there again, so I got some more video. A little bit more subdued. As he sticks his neck out, this was great. And then when I switched the camera angles a little bit, the camera was having it was for some reason it was focusing more on the fish than on the turtle so it was a little blurrier a little out of focus Then I handed the camera to Tara, actually just so I didn't have it in my hand while I was decided to you know, rebuild this. Every so often, somebody kind of does some artwork, if you will, building, you know, taking the rocks here and kind of building into something. On, and for the last couple of times, there's not been anything there. This has been kind of taken apart, and I decided to get a little bit of exercise and... Actually, it was multiple purposes. One, I was feeling creative. And also, I kind of wanted to see what kind of, uh, as far as for, for diving as a diver, um, how well I could control myself while doing this work. And I have to admit, looking at it from the third person now, I think I did pretty good pretty good. I'm actually much more pleased with the kind of control I had in keeping from kicking up too much silt and maintaining the kind of buoyancy I needed to. <clears throat> and part of the trick is knowing, again, being comfortable with your own equipment, your own body in the water, but it's also uh, not feeling like you have to be rushed to accomplish something. So keep it slow and methodical. Think about what you're doing so as you're moving things around that you, you disturb the area as little as possible. Now, doing this here is very different from if, if I were to do this, say, in Lake Amistad here in Del Rio. Uh, Texas, because this natural bottom is much cleaner, if you will, whereas Lake Amistad is nothing but moon surface, so it's just tons of thick, nasty silt. So it doesn't take much to kick up silt that will uh, take a while to settle. So obviously I would have to be much slower if I were doing something like this uh, here in Del Rio, as opposed to uh, Balmeray.
But if you look, very little, very, very few times do I actually spend with my feet planted on the bottom. <clears throat> Even with these big rocks, I mean, these were, <laughs> these were heavy. You see, I keep from thrashing around and trying. You, you, you get to a point where you don't have this uh, driving need to have your feet underneath you when you're doing something. One of the things that I noticed early on with, um, with students and just newer divers is... Uh, is that as they're descending, as they as they get uh, close to the bottom, they struggle to get their feet underneath them, and that you really don't have to, as you can see here. You very almost never do I actually have my feet underneath me, and really the more stable position for a diver as you get down to the bottom is on your knees because you can lean backward you can lean forward with much more control and your center of gravity is lower so you're able to uh, you're able to control your movement much easier with a lot less work oh uh, and um, also if you're if you're dealing with waves or surge or current um, you have a lot less uh, you have you, there's a lot less of yourself that is susceptible to the effects of the surge or the current and you can sting, you can resist it better uh, Tara in the chat room uh, said did you tell everyone this is officially Balmeray Stone, <laughs> Stonehenge which yeah it kind of is a matter of fact actually I, and I didn't take video of it because I uh, just didn't take the camera on the, my final dive because I was by myself uh, after building this you'll see the end result uh, after building this I actually went down one more time and added to it actually added a little walkway and another little um, like a circular uh, garrison or something. I don't know what you call it, but it, it kind of added more to it. Okay, now this thing was heavy, so I definitely had to get my foot underneath me here. You see how that thing was tremendously heavy. And then the last push to get this thing up here on the side. It was kind of slippery too, so I had to figure out how to get around this thing, grab a hold of it big and solidly enough to lift it into place. <clears throat> it's kind of like a Discovery Channel thing <laughs> now that I watch this to clear a little bit of water out of my mask there Still got to put a top on this thing. And again, very little, very little silt kicked up. Now, and this was, I have to say, this was more challenging for me than normal because I'm not using my regular fins here. Uh, you'll notice that I've got these silver fins 
um, on. <clears throat> um, I normally use the Tusa split fins uh, because I get more finessed control over them, and so I'm really not used to these fins. They are lighter, so I'm not as foot heavy, so that was actually more beneficial here. But I do love the control I get much better with, um, with the split fins. But my, uh, my blue Tusa split fins, which you'll see in just about every other video that I'm in, um, they were literally, they've, they've kind of run their course. They've got cracks in, in the plastic and is fa are falling apart. Yeah, this one was heavy. And get up on here and down. Yay. <coughs> Um, and so, as a matter of fact, I just just receipt took receipt of uh, took delivery of my replacement fins. They're now in red, so they'll actually match my BC. So I'm, I'm anxious to get a dive in this weekend. There was nobody available to dive today, which was kind of disappointing. But I may have some takers for Monday and get a dive in. <clears throat> you know what I may think I do I need to do it just occurred to me and then, oh, after I finished building it, I came back around, and this kid was over here playing on it. I'm like, dude, don't mess with Stonehenge. <laughs> I think he was playing with a uh, crawdad on here. See, he looks like he looks like he has a little uh, leak, O-ring leak, or no? Actually, that looks like it's coming from. You see the little trail of bubbles coming from his his uh, dump, his shoulder dump on his BC. And that's not the symbol you give me, dude. You give me the OK symbol. The thumbs up means you want to go up. <coughs> And here, a couple of divers as they uh, get get surrounded by more of the little fish. And I need to fix that. It's not C Live. This is a typo. C Life DC fourteen hundred Pro. See all the fish gathering around them. I mean, it's awesome. <laughs> Look at that. That could be disconcerting. That might freak some people out. <clears throat> but it's actually fun. Now see, he's not supposed to be feeding the fish. They actually have a rule, you're not supposed to be feeding the fish. And there's the kid with the crawdad. So, uh, yeah, that was awesome. That was an uh, awesome time. We, we love diving Balmeray. You, you just don't know what you're missing when you, uh, if you miss out on a, a, um, a trip up there. And while we do not have any other, um, we do not have any more Balmeray trips scheduled. Uh, as we get moved towards the end of the season, there are opportunities to go up there. You just it, you probably don't have much of a chance of getting a uh, a campsite or a cabin up there. You'd have to stay um, uh, at the the one of the hotels in town, 
which is just about four miles uh, away from Balmeray. Still not bad. I mean, that's what we did on this trip. And, uh, uh, but it's so worth it to, to go up there for a weekend, even if it's just going up there on a Friday and coming back on a Saturday, which is what we did, did in this case. Uh, I really like it when we get to spend a full-blown weekend up there, but um, right now that's not a feasible option. But for some of you, it might be, and it, it is so incredibly worth it. It really is. We have a great time. So, all right, so that was our Balmeray, our anniversary trip. I think that's going to <laughs> become pretty much a staple for us if we always go up there on our anniversary weekend. So, um, speaking of pictures and photography, I'm really getting more and more into this as, uh, uh, as I learn more, it becomes more enticing, and I see the kind of work like you saw with uh, David Loftus' uh, pictures of our show, I learn more and more about the basics of, of uh, exposure and ISO settings and uh, um, um, white balance and things like that. And so I start, I'm starting to actually recognize uh, some of the things where I see somebody taking a picture. I'm like, oh, if you'd only adjusted this, it would have made that picture so much better and, and those kinds of things. And... Um, so one of the things I kind of mentioned last week is uh, I've got the brand new uh, Nokia Lumia 1020, which takes, it's a great phone, uh, regardless of what Scuba Bob would tell you. It is an awesome phone, and it just takes some awesome pictures. And so I do have uh, some pictures that I took uh, with the, the Lumia 1020. And the beauty of this this camera is it, it does have, and they kind of brag about it, Nokia's thing is zoom reinvented. And it really is kind of interesting because you can zoom in with this and it's lossless zoom. So you can zoom in on something you want to take a picture with and it takes a really good shot. But the beauty of it is if you decide, because it takes two pictures at one time, it takes a 5 megapixel version and it takes a 38 megapixel version, and so the five megapixel version is what you would share typically because it's small. They're one to two megabytes in size. The 38 megapixel version version of these pictures is any, in the 10 megabyte range per picture. So obviously you can eat up your storage really quickly with these. But the beauty is, if you zoom in on something and you decide, you know what, this isn't how I wanted to frame it, you can actually, after the fact, you can actually do what they call reframe the picture. And you can edit the high resolution version and actually zoom back out and zoom back in to something different on the picture. And the level of detail that you get is, is really striking for something that doesn't have a an optical zoom like a regular uh, professional SLR type camera. <clears throat> but you can see how gorgeous the pictures are with this. This is a shot of the Paul Pogue Theater. And if, and I, I won't be able to zoom in on this one because of the way I've layered it into the, the slideshow. But I, you can zoom in to, if you look right below the name of the Paul Pogue Theater, you see an air conditioner. That's where the offices are up there. Um, and right on top of it is a pigeon. And you can actually zoom in and pretty good, get some pretty good detail on the pigeon with this picture. It's pretty awesome. Here was a shot. Speaking of the ho one of the hotels you can stay at in, um, uh, in uh, around Balmeray, this is the place that we stayed at, the Oso Floho. I jokingly call it the Los Opso. <laughs> But uh, this place is, is really nice. They got nice rooms. Unfortunately, the walls are paper thin. So if you have noisy neighbors like we did this particular weekend, uh, it seemed like everybody in their extended family decided to stay in the room next door to us. I'm betting they probably didn't pay for all those people. But, uh, and they decided they were going to practically tear down the room so we could hear it. It was ridiculous. But the area, the, the courtyard is great gorgeous and I, I said I, I decided I needed to get a few pictures of this because it really is pretty and uh, again gorgeous gorgeous flowers and and uh, uh, 
decorations, etc. There, well done. <clears throat> Again, taking advantage of some of the the uh, depth of field uh, capability of the 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 camera on the Lumia 1020. This one was cool because if you'll notice, uh, these swallows hang around here. I mean, especially this time of the evening, they're just going nuts. I mean, they're just above the light. You see on the light of just about every door, there is a nest. And I happened to catch this one swallow in mid-flight. He had just launched from the, that nest there, and I caught him in mid-flight, almost stopping him. There wasn't quite enough light for the camera to, to be fast enough to catch the wing completely stopped, but it was pretty close. And if I were to zoom in on it, it would, you'd just really be impressed with the, the detail. It's really awesome. All right, this little critter, speaking of unique encounters, uh, these little ground squirrels are so used to people, especially people feeding them, that they just kind of hang around. Unless you, unless you get really close to them, they just kind of hang around. Now, this one found a dead uh, dragonfly sitting right there by our picnic table. So he decided, okay, it's time for lunch. So he got right in there. And here was a little bit closer shot as he's munching away. And again, he was not afraid. <clears throat> And this was the the uh, the 25th anniversary that we attended last night. That's uh, Hugo and Susie, Susemma. Uh, they it was a really nice ceremony, and she looked great in her white dress. They got married when they were 17. There's a picture of them cutting the cake. And that's all that I have for those pictures. So let me show you, uh, zooming in, the kind of detail. Uh, let me open this up with... You know what? Let me, uh, instead of that one, let me open this one up. Okay, here is a picture. Let me switch to the screen region. Here is a picture of one of our dogs, Ronan, you met earlier at the beginning of the podcast. He was crashed out, and so I wanted to get a nice uh, picture of him. He was just barely reacting to me taking the picture. So let me zoom in. You can see the kind of detail that this camera gets. Now, I mean, look at the detail on that, the hairs. But even more impressive, as I move in on his eye, you can see the reflection of the Lumia 1020 <laughs> in his eye that was taking the picture. That's how great the resolution on this camera is. It's just insane. And then also, let me get, I think this is the one. Bring this down where you can see it. All right, so here's that picture I showed you earlier of the ground squirrel. You can see the veins in the dead in the dead dragonfly's wings. That's how impressive this camera is. Just amazing. So see, I'd probably take that picture and reframe that. There we go. See, that'd make a great picture just all by itself. In great detail. Remarkable, remarkable. And then last, and last, last but not least, the video capabilities. Of course, it's a full HD video camera. Let's see. I think I've got this up on Windows Media Player. Yes, I do. All right. So this, this little cutie, he was just hilarious to watch. So 
So I got down, I, a bit, literally I laid down on the ground. <clears throat> and again, this is still at the park there at Belmarais. So he's just kind of watching me and he, I guess he decided that I was not a threat. Even as I got a little closer to him, This is just great footage. Again, a unique encounter. <laughs> He's just kind of scoping things out. Again, so he decides that I'm not a threat. So I just lay down. Again, this is like Discovery Channel stuff. All right, let me fast forward a little bit here. Returns around on me. So I, I edged a little closer. I mean, look how close I'm getting to this guy. You can see him breathing. <laughs> this just tripped me out because I thought he's going to notice, get a little scared, and he's going to, because his hole is right there. He could have just ducked into his hole really quickly. And that may be why he was feeling a little, uh, he was feeling safer, I guess. <clears throat> I'm getting even closer. Fortunately, I didn't refocus. It's hard for me to see if I had it refocused. So, there we go. I mean, look, this is just amazing video. <laughs> He's just laying there. No big thing. So I said, okay, I'm tired of looking at your backside. So I slowly start to work my way around to the side. You see an ant crawl out there. So I move a little bit more. And is this incredible or what? And so I back away from him. <laughs> yes, it was amazing. It was remarkable. So, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, this, this camera is remarkable. It, I don't feel the need to carry... We have a nice HD video camera. Now, obviously, we can store a lot more video on it than I can on this phone, especially with the high def. But if you just, if, if you're out somewhere and, you know, you've got like your, let's say, like in our situation, I have my laptop. I typically take it everywhere on vacation, etc. So we can go out and catch a lot of pictures and video and then dump it to the, dump it to our laptop and remove it from the phone and then go back out and get some more, you know, pictures and video 
it's a lot easier to carry the phone around where it's doing multiple functions and get that kind of quality of, of pictures and video than it is carrying a big, even though they're small now, a, a, an actual dedicated uh, video camera. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that those are useless to us. I mean, for instance, with the play that we just finished, Curtains, I would have loved to have set up our video camera to record the show. Um, but uh, I didn't. Hindsight being 2020, I should have. But obviously, in this particular case, a, using a phone to do that would not be practical. Using an actual camera on a tripod would be practical. So, uh, but for your typical vaca vacation where you want to get some great shots and video of the family and everything and the scenery that you see, I, I can't think of a better option if you're trying to go as light as possible. And since most of your cameras these days are rechargeable as well, you don't have really much advantage with SLR cameras other than an optical zoom. Now, my wife's camera, uh, because it does have a really great optical zoom, she can get some really crisp zoom-in shots that do uh, that are definitely better than than my uh, my Nokia Lumia 1020. <clears throat> so she brings that along, but it was really convenient. Like last night at our uh, at the uh, ceremony, for her battery ran out while she was taking pictures, or ran down to a pretty dangerous level. So I was like, "Not to worry, we can get some really good pictures with this." So uh, I was able to augment this the 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 situation uh, with good pictures from uh, from this device. So I, I just think that if you if you want multiple function and Taking pictures is your big thing. Uh, this is a strong contender. It, it, this easily, everybody is rating this high. As a matter of fact, uh, it is winning all the, the the battles of pictures, right? Of cameras in phones right now. And in fact, uh, one of the professional photographers for National Geographic has been using it exclusively to take video and pictures on his trip through the the Midwest or Southwest or whatever it is. So he's going through Grand Canyon and everything. So he's been taking some great pictures of video of that he's been really extolling the virtues of, of how wonderful a camera is on this, that he doesn't need his SLR for it. And the pictures he's getting, he's posting, uh, are absolutely striking. But that just shows you when you've got a great device that has some great software and you know what you're doing, you can really, um, make top-notch professional quality and that's kind of what I'm I'm starting to get into it's fed my hunger to do that getting a better underwater camera the the sea life DC 1400 Pro is great and I'm and I know it can do better if I learn more about it uh, so as a diver and just a person who likes to go different places um, I'm, I'm finding that uh, that it's it's exciting to really uh, expand my knowledge and thereby expand my capability to use technology to create great memories because ultimately that's what it's about you come back from these trips and you have great memories my wife who is a uh, scrapbooker an avid scrapbooker and she, as a matter of fact that's what she's doing right now uh, with a friend of ours uh, she <laughs> she just can't get enough of these pictures she'll go out and and print picture after picture after picture just to get the right ones to do a good scrapbook. And the end results are fantastic. But you could spend a lot of time and a lot of uh, money, effort to come up with the, all the neat bling and designs for the scrapbooks, but it's all kind of wasted if you don't have good pictures uh, that these that all of the, the scrapbooking is showing off. And so it just becomes even more important to us that we get these things, uh, that we get great pictures and we get great video to, to create video memories and things like that. And, you know, uh, for those who are uh, kind of your budding uh, Scorsese's or Lucas's or Spielberg's, there's a lot more software that's free or really inexpensive available for computers now that let you do a really cool job very easily of, of uh, showcasing video work that you did. I mean, I, I literally put together the video you saw of Balmeray 
that took actually more time for the computer to render the end product than it was for me to just put it together. So I took all these clips that I did with the uh, with our Sea Life underwater camera and put a few flourishes on there, layered some music on there, and you had a nice little effect that's more enjoyable to watch than just simply a bunch of video clips together. And it, the, I, I spent a lot less time actually putting it all together than I did actually letting the computer render the end product. So it's, it's worth it to get into it. It's especially as inexpensive it is, but it all starts with a good, you know, it's the, that old saying, garbage in, garbage out. You got to start with good product in. So learn more about the devices, f get the best devices you can, and then start learning how not just to, only to use the technology, but some of the basic ideas of how you frame the picture. Where do you want to focus? I mean, you don't want to always take the picture from behind everything. Where are your light sources? All, these are all things I've been learning as a course of picking up the photography and the videography, but then also the podcasts. If you go back and look at the first uh, several episodes of the podcast, you see interesting lighting because we a, didn't know what to get, what to do. We were learning as we go. Uh, and so the images look much better now, and they're still not anywhere near uh, where I want them to be ultimately because I see other examples out on the Internet of really well done uh, video and uh, in a studio like this. And so I'm just, okay, well, what is the difference? What is it that they're doing that I'm not doing? Or what is it that they're not doing that I am doing that's actually creating uh, a problem in the imagery? <clears throat> but this is all part of this. Whether you're doing this above water or underwater, it doesn't matter. All of these things are true. Lighting, white balance, contrast, uh, focus, uh, optical st stabilization. All of this is important. And in fact, uh, most of your, your dive certifications uh, or mo most of your dive certifying agencies have a number of specialties including underwater photography and underwater videography. So if you really want to get into it and, and learn more about it, you can always um, hit up your dive shop or instructor and see if they have available uh, the uh, underwater photography or underwater videography course. It's well worth it to, to take that to learn more uh, about how to do all this stuff. So... That's my spiel on getting into uh, photography, videography, and kind of showing off the, the uh, capabilities of both the Sea Life DC1400 Pro camera as well as the camera capability on the Nokia Lumia 1020 uh, Windows phone. So let us, uh, as we're winding down here, let's jump into the administrivia. So uh, our next dive club meeting is 19 September uh, 2013 at 7 p.m. at Rudy's Restaurant. We would love to see you there. Love to see you there. Uh, we kind of ebb and flow with uh, how many people show up. But, you know, basically it's an opportunity to just kind of have a nice dinner because they have great food there and just kind of share uh, diving experiences, ideas, talk about potential trips, things, that, things, things of that nature. And as I said earlier, uh, we've finished up all of our scheduled dive trips to Balmeray State Park, but but uh, there's still quite a bit of time before the uh, the weather turns and making trips up there uh, less than enjoyable. Always remembering, of course, that because it's spring fed, that water is actually the same temperature all year around, 74 to 76 degrees. So really all you're worried about as you get later in the season is is it colder on out of the water than it is in the water so um uh, so we're still talking about uh, potentially going up there just on kind of on the fly saying you know what we got a three-day weekend coming up or something like that let's let's go up and uh, we got one one more scuba class scheduled uh, September 26th through the 29th. So you need to be signing up. I mean, this is basically this next week. You need to be signing up so I can get materials to you to start your self-study. And uh, if you'd like to keep up with the uh, goings-on with the Del Rio Dive Club, you can visit us at our Facebook page. Just look for Del Rio Dive Club altogether. Or you can send us a message uh, via Skype, which is now merged with Windows Messenger. Just send it to Two Guys Who Dive. And then also, you can uh, look us up on DelRioDiveClub.com. 
now one other uh, one other programming note is that uh, since this uh, this podcast is done at the illustrious City Fox Production Studios, uh, which is another fancy way of saying our home studio here. Um, and we'll be eventually producing other programs. We're working on kind of in the genesis point of, of uh, at least one other program at the moment. Uh, what we've started to do is we've, we've created a, a page, an actual YouTube page for SETI Fox Productions. And so anything that we produce under that banner will, will now be stored uh, or uploaded there. So starting with episode 73... We started rolling the the shows there. So if you go to SETI Fox Productions on YouTube, you will see the um, you'll see the episodes there, and anything else that we produce under the SETI Fox Productions um, banner will show up there. So this this episode, when we're finished, will get uploaded there. <clears throat> um, you can still view the previous podcasts, episodes two through seventy uh, two. On the Scuba Dog 2008 um, YouTube page, those will stay there because uh, it's just too much effort to turn around and pull those across to uh, to SETI Fox. But uh, so all of the future productions are going to go to the SETI Fox Productions page, and then we also do have a SETI Fox Productions Facebook uh, page, but it's in its fledgling stage. Stage, and we actually do have a uh, website, SETIFOX.net. Um, hence, where, that's where my email address comes from. But so, if you're interested in just checking out uh, other aspects of SETI Fox uh, Productions, uh, some history on Tara and myself, our activities with acting and stage performing and things like that, uh, you can check that out as well. So just go to SETIFOX.net. So anyway, if you want to send me email. You can, of course, send it to robert.wade at setifox.net. Or you can follow me on the Twitter uh, just by looking at at Robert CFP. Uh, if Robert were here, we'd throw his stuff up, but he's not. So we're not going to. And uh, so I think that covers everything else we had on the list. Yes, to, yes it does. So hopefully next week. We'll have all players back on deck. Uh, might be able to we'll try and get uh, Troy to join us uh, next week as well. We'll see if that works out. Uh, so that pretty much finishes up for this week. Uh, I had a great time and hope you did too. If you're not seeing this live and seeing this on YouTube, please make sure you subscribe to our channel. And uh, that way you get notified every time we post something, uh, upload anything new up there. And check us out on the Facebook page, too, where we try to be really active on there. Especially if you're looking at diving in the Del Rio area. Let us know ahead of time, and we can get some divers. I am pretty much ready 24-7, seven days a week. Give me, uh, just give me enough heads up that I can grab my tank and something to snack on. And I can head out to uh, to meet you on a dive. Um, like I said, that's why well, I'm scuba dive. I, I will I will dive with anybody, anytime, anywhere, especially if it's a night dive. Love night dives. So that finishes up for this week. We will see you, uh, God willing, uh, for another exciting episode of Two Guys Who Dive. See ya.